This week on Q&A, our guest is Neil Sheehan. His new book, A Fiery Peace in a Cold War, is on the nuclear arms race, told through the life of General Bernard Schriever, who led the U.S. military in researching and developing the ICBM and other missiles. We also look back at Mr. Sheehan's book, A Bright Shining Lie, John Paul Van and America in Vietnam, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 1989. Neil Sheehan, it was 21 years ago this month that you started this network on its trek to just to look at books and to do this interview show every Sunday night at 8 and 11. But I want to show you a little moment from 21 years ago. What do you want to do next? I don't really know. I want to help promote the book because I, uh, that's a necessity. And then the only specific thing I have in mind that I would like to do is to go back to Vietnam to see what's happened to the country and to write about it. Then what I will do, I don't know. I'm not worried about it. I might go back to daily journalism. I don't, re don't really know. I've stayed busy all my life. And the one thing that I've been taught is, is that if you want to work, you'll find plenty to do. Uh, and so I'm sure that I'll find something to do. And I, if you learn as a newspaper man that you go from story to story. In this case, I went to a book that trapped me for, for 15 years, but it's finally done now. And I'll move on. I'll do something else. That was your book, Bright Shining Lie, 21 years ago. And the book I have in my hand is called A Fiery Peace in a Cold War, Bernard Schriever and the Ultimate Weapon. 21 years later, why did you decide to spend your time on this subject? Well, I decided I wanted to write another book rather than go back to newspapering. And first, I, I went back to Vietnam, as I mentioned, and, and I did a short retrospective book on Vietnam called After the War Was Over, Hanoi and Saigon. And then it was, I had to find another topic. It was time to move on. Uh, and someone said to me, why don't you write a book on the arms race in the Cold War? I said, my God, that's a, that's a pretty diffuse subject. Uh, I, wanted, I want to do something with a, with a narrative. And so I, I started researching, and I was over, it's about 1994 now. I was over at the Air Force Association in Arlington here, right near Washington, and I was in their library, and they keep files on prominent Air Force figures. And someone said to me, you ought to look up Bernard, Shriver, Bernard or Benny, as he was called, Shriver. So I asked the librarian for the file on Bernard Shriver. And she handed it to me, and I opened it up. And right there, the first, right in the beginning of the file, was a photograph of this general leaning up against the table with all of these missiles around him. It's in the book, that, that photograph. And I said, this guy looks interesting. So when I got home, I asked some questions about him. He was well known within the, he was famous within the Air Force, but not outside. And so when I got home, I looked him up in the phone book, and he turned out to be eight blocks from my house, to live in, be living in retirement eight blocks from my house. So I called him and arranged to come over and talk to him. And it began the first of 52 interviews with him. And then I realized that this man had, had stood at a pivotal point in the Cold War. See, we, always, we look at the Cold War as one long glacial period, but it wasn't. It, it was a period, there were, there, were, there were changes in it, and in, particularly at the beginning, it was a very unstable business in which we could have gone into nuclear war with the Soviets. And uh, I realized after talking to this man that he had stood at the center of that pivotal period when, and, and when uh, he and a group of others with vision had really saved us from what could well have been a nuclear uh, uh, war and you and I, but for him and those who work with him, you and I might not be be sitting here. I mean, we we might be or might, we might well be irradiated dust. I have in my hand a bright shining lie. It's the new version, but uh, brought out by Modern Library just out this year. Uh, this book's about 800 and some pages long. Uh, do you remember how many of these the original copies sold of both paperback and hardback? Hardcover sold, uh, the original hardcover sold about 165,000 copies. Uh, paperback, I don't know, a lot more. And in the, our interview, and for those who weren't with us 21 years ago when all this started, we sat down 
in a studio right across the hallway here for two and a half hours and ran five 30-minute programs over five nights. And then you sat with us for a call-in show at the end of that fifth night. And that actually started Book Notes. That was, we didn't start it until the beginning of 89. But in that particular interview, you, I'm going to show another clip from there where you talk about a man named John Paul Van. And the reason we're going to do that is because this is Bernie Schriever, then it was John Paul Van. Let's look at what you said about him. I realized that if I wrote a, a book about this extraordinary man, I could tell the story of the war through him because he was such a compelling figure. And he summed up in the 10 years he'd been in Vietnam, the American venture there. And he summed up the way we like to think of ourselves, the qualities that we admired in ourselves in that period. This enormous drive, the, this, this brilliant analytical mind, this incredible energy, sleeping four hours and only needing four hours of sleep a night, uh, the fearlessness, et cetera. He had an extraordinary metabolism. Uh, uh, all of these things that we, re we really admired in ourselves as a people. And, and he, had, he had devoted himself to Vietnam, and he had died there. And I felt that if I, if I wrote a story, a biography of him, I could also write a history of the war. That's why I started out. And then, of course, I was trapped in the enterprise. <laughs> and it was too late to go back. Fifteen years, as you said earlier, you spent on that book. How many years in total did you spend on this book? Probably about f about about fourteen years. Did, uh, did Benny Schriever turn out to be what John Paul Van was for you? Yes, him? he did. Because Why? I, because there was a period, as I said, in the Cold War, when first we got the bomb, then we 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 fell into this period of hostilities with the Soviet Union, uh, but then they acquired their bomb. And it was a very unstable period of time. We were dependent because you had to bring this, this nuclear, the possession of the bomb by both sides, to some sort of stability. And there was no stability because we were depending on the aircraft, the bomber, the Strategic Air Command under Curtis LeMay, who was the, the figure for general, uh, the general in Stanley Kubrick's uh, Dr. Strangelove. We were depending on the SAC, the Strategic Air Command. The Soviets were not, decided not to go down that road. They, in secret, they, they, they were going down the road of intercontinental ballistic missiles. They were working their way toward building one. Now, you only got 15 minutes warning of an intercontinental, of an incoming missile in those years because of the radars, because of the limitation of the radars. And if they had acquired a fleet of ICBMs, the, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, they would have destroyed the credibility of the, of the airplane as a deterrent. And you'd have got a period of real instability in which you might have gotten, well have gotten some adventurism by Soviet leaders, which would have led to a nuclear war, which would have destroyed the whole Northern Hemisphere because of the side effects of nuclear weapons, nuclear, nuclear winter, uh, uh, the radia radioactive, radioactive dust coming down every time it rained and making everyone, killing everyone. It, the, and, and so you had to bring, a, bring stability to this period. And what Sh Schriever saw this, he, he and, and then, then later those who worked for him, saw what was happening, that you had to, we had to build our own fleet of missiles in order to create a nuclear stalemate, which is what he did. He and those who worked with him did. They created a, a, a situation where neither country could pull off what was called a first strike against the other and escape destruction itself. Uh, Eisenhower had been, lived in fear of what he called a nuclear Pearl Harbor, which, which was a surprise attack by the, by the Soviets. Uh, it's called a first strike in nuclear ease, a nuclear strategy. And by building our own set of, of, of weapons, we created this nuclear stalemate, which neither country could, 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 could pull off a first strike, and you got stability, which lasted except for Khrushchev, who was the, uh, the exemplar of that Soviet adventurer who might have triggered, almost triggered nuclear war during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Once the, this sunk in to the Soviet leaders, you've got people like Re Leonid Brezhnev, who did not want a nuclear war. <laughs> he, wanted, he was a status quo type. He wanted to enjoy the perks of power, uh, the mistresses, uh, the tame boar hunting, the collection of foreign cars, including a Lincoln Nixon gave him. These were men who were not 
they they were they were opponents, but they were not interested in destroying their own country by attempting to destroy ours. So, these men really saved us from uh, the prob possibility, possibly the probability, of a nuclear war. And and uh, they're genuine American heroes, and he personified it. Go back. I, this is in, in 1955 when all the discussions became very active. Up till this day, I got on the internet today, and you can correct me if my figures are wrong, but there is at least 5,500 intercontinental ballistic missiles active today with the Navy, the Air Force, the Army. Am I right about that? There, that that's probably too size, too large a number for ICBMs, but in terms of missiles, yes. You've got the Navy uh, uh, ICB, which are ICBMs out of out of the, the, the nuclear submarines, and you've got 450 uh, Minuteman missiles, which are intercontinental missiles on alert, and the Army has tactical missiles. And all of that happened starting back when you started basically this yeah, book. Well, yeah, th that's right. Because we were LeMay, Le uh, who was General May, who was the command of in command of Strategic Air Command, believed in the bomber. <laughs> It was, it was his, his, he had, he'd been the great bomber leader in World War II. I don't know if you've ever seen a film called 12 O'Clock High, a late night television. It's about the bombing of Germany in 1942-43. When these men were going through uh, without fighter escort, uh, taking on German fighters for an hour and a half, fighting their way in, deep into Germany to bomb the industries. LeMay lost 40 bombers and the raid of, on the first raid on the Messerschmitt works at Regensburg, deep into Germany. But the bombers got through. So he believed in the bomber. He wasn't interested in missiles. They were effing firecrackers, as he called them. Uh, he was opposed to the program. Schriever saw that the missile would destroy the credibility of the aircraft. He, he was a visionary uh, and, and, and pressed ahead against major opposition from LeMay and the other bomber generals. How much firepower is there on the tip of one of those ICBMs today? Right now, the uh, Minuteman has, uh, has, a f has enough to destroy several cities. <laughs> but compared to, say, Hiroshima or oh, Nagasaki? Vastly more. Um, two or three megatons. Uh, and one megaton equals 80 Hiroshimas. Let me go back to Benny Schriever. Uh, Four-star general in the United States Air Force before it was over, died, you say in your book, June 20th, 2005, at 94 years old. You did 52 interviews with this man. Set that up. What, were the, what was the environment, and how long did you talk to him? We would meet on Saturday. He was in between marriages when I first met him. And we would meet on Saturday mornings at his house, which is about eight blocks from where I live in northwest Washington, up by American University and before he went to lunch at Burning Tree, which was his golf club. And, and, and we would, and, and, and I, I, I'd pick up where I left off the last time and I'd take him through the story. And uh, it was, uh, and we got, he was a very, uh, Bernie was, a, Benny was, a, was a, a, a very thoughtful man. He, he wanted to make sure of that you were the person to tell his story. At first, he was a bit standoffish with me. And then he decided that I was the person to tell a story, and he became very cooperative. How old would he have been the first time you met with him? He was in his 80s, uh, and, uh, uh, but, but in excellent health, excellent health, uh, with, with all of his uh, mental faculties fully intact, very acute. And I asked him for things like, I told him, I said, General, I've got to have your entire military record, the whole thing, from the very beginning from 1932 when you when he joined the Army Air Corps, including all your efficiency reports, good or bad. Uh, and he didn't have that. I said, you've got to submit it. You've got to ask for it. I need it. Fine, he said. I'll get it for you. And he did. I mean, he, he withheld nothing. He, he told all the people uh, who'd worked for him, who were still with us, um, to talk to me and to tell me the truth. Uh, and they, of course, led to others. Uh, and, uh, the, the, and I was racing the Grim Reaper, because these were older men, and 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 the, their lives were were were, were, in, were in the twilight years, and so I had to really work fast and hard to, to get. I did 120 interviews uh, to get the, to get the interviews I needed to, to, to tell the story, to get a narrative, to tell the story. I believe, as you know, in writing the history in narrative form, uh, because I think 
you have to, and and I believe in catching that segment that that segment of history, which is in men's minds, in the memory. It's an important segment segment of history. And if you don't catch it while they're still alive, obviously it's gone forever. A sidebar is the woman he married, who people our age can remember her from entertainment years, Joni James. That's right. The is she still star. alive? She is still alive, and she's still living in the home they shared together, where I first met him when before he married her. But she was twenty years younger than he was. Yes, yeah. uh, but they they uh, they met down in Palm Beach and fell in love, and 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 got married in his later years. He was eighty-seven when they married, uh, but uh, happy eighty-seven to have married her. And she was a she was he was a lucky guy. I called it the Shriver luck. He never, he never had an air. Uh, he joined the Air Corps in '32, and planes were quite unsafe, but uh, and and flew through the airmail crisis when 12 pilots were killed flying these uninstrumented planes through snowstorms and hailstorms and whatever in the Midwest trying to deliver the mail. Then he was never, never, and he flew constantly in World War II, never went a crash. You were at the funeral. Yes. And I'm just going to dip into a little part of the narrative here and get you to explain a couple of things. You wrote, he bent over Joni for a few minutes with words of condolence while everyone watched in curiosity. The man was Donald Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense since the outset of the administration of George W. Bush, comma, doomed to a resignation in disgrace because of his fervid promotion of the catastrophic war in Iraq. Both of those, the last statement from you about the catastrophic war in Iraq I want you to talk about, but also before that, explain that funeral and why was Don Rumsfeld there and all the other, as you say, 44 stars were there at that funeral. Yes, well, uh, the chief of staff of the Air Force at the time, General Jumper, um, first of all, I should back off. General Schriever came to be known as the father of the modern, modern high technological Air Force uh, as a result of, 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 build, of building the ICBM and advocating other technological advances. He was, as I say, a technological visionary, like the founder of the modern Air Force, who was Hap Arnold, General Arnold of World War II, who was Schriever's first commanding officer in 1932, and who was a technological visionary. And Schriever was, in effect, his disciple and his descendant. And the Air Force was deeply grateful to this man for what he had accomplished and for the Air Force he'd, really cre he'd, he'd created. And so General Jumper, who was chief of staff, decided he was not going to be buried as just a four-star general. He was going to be buried as a chief of staff. And so they gave him all the honors they would have normally given a chief of staff, the flyover of the planes, which is very dramatic. There are three aircraft with a space for the missing, missing uh, co-pilot, missing wingman. Uh, and uh, then Rumsfeld, I gather, felt that he had to come and pay tribute, too. And so in the midst of this, at the last minute, just before the last few minutes, just before the, the ceremony ended, Rumsfeld suddenly showed up from the wings uh, as Joni, who was an actor, who was on a stage star, said he, he, he looked like an actor coming in from the wings, <laughs> and he did. He came in and he, he, he said some words of condolence to her, and then he disappeared. How well did you get to know him from a personal standpoint, and was it tough on you when he died? It was in the sense that, I, well, I, I, he was he was he was ninety four years old, and he was he was declining, and had been declining for several years. Uh, but it was tough in the sense that I hated to see this. I, I had gotten to very to respect this man. We'd become very good friends, and I really come to respect and understand what he had accomplished. And he helped me. Uh, he, he, he said to me, after we got to know each other well, during one of their reunions, these men had a reunion every year, they call it the old timers reunion, and I went to every one of them. And he said to me at one of them, look, I want you to do this right. I won't be here when it's finished, I know that. <laughs> but I want you to do this right, I want you to tell the story right. Uh, and so I had enormous respect for him. And, and uh, but he died uh, in the fullness of life. And so uh, in, in that sense, one, one, one couldn't regret it because he'd had a f really full life and, and a good life. And he, he had accomplished what he'd set out to accomplish. And he'd helped me to tell the story through people. 
uh, which is what I, I, I believe in, in, in writing history well and in a narrative form, in novelistic form. But you have to be careful. You have to, you have to tell the, you ha it's tough to do it that way because you have to make sure you don't distort the truth. Um, and by using him, he was, he was my lens on this story as Van was my lens on Vietnam. He, I want to talk about the Vietnam thing and to connect it again and I'll ask you after we show this clip um, about your statement about the Iraq war. But let's go back to the last time I saw you was about 10 years ago when we did a series on writers. Right. With David Halberstam, we were down on the mall near the Vietnam Memorial and we talked for three hours about your book and his book. And uh, But here's David Halberstam at, at that time with you sitting next to him. Let's watch this. Will there ever be coverage of any future endeavor, any war endeavor in this country like there was in Vietnam? Um, if America's involved. I would not think so because I don't think we're going to get into a long grinding war like that again. In the Gulf War it was all hive technology and then you had about four days of, of armored combat and then of course in Afghanistan it's very elite units that go in where you really can't have reporters I don't think camping out with them but a lot of it is also part of it is the new nature of the technology and the elite units laser guided missiles and stuff like that and part of it is a desire to control uh, the reporting but you really can't control the reporting of things don't work I mean it will out and that's one thing they'll finally learn if it doesn't work people will know. David Halberstam uh, killed in an automobile, a strange automobile accident out in California. What, uh, start with that, what was your reaction when you heard that? Oh, it was devastating. David was a very close friend. He and I were partners in Vietnam. We'd worked together there. Uh, he'd worked for the New York Times. I was with the UPI and we partnered up. We, we shared, we, we, we would each, we shared an office, which was my, the front room of my apartment there. It was the dining room table. He typed on one side, I typed on the other. We kept the friendship all those years from 1963 on. And uh, we talked, we didn't see each other as often as I would have liked because he lived in New York and I lived down here. But we'd talk on the phone frequently and, and I, I, I hear his voice all the time. Uh, the, the phone rings and I hear David say, how you doing old buddy? Uh, it was a very close, wonderful friendship, and he, it was so sudden, the, his, his death uh, in, in that auto accident that Susan, my wife Susan, who is also, as you know, a writer, uh, she came up the stairs and she said, David's gone. And, and uh, she was, I mean, heart rent, broken over it, and, and, and I was just, I, I broke down. I mean, I, I, I couldn't help it. He was, he was, he was just, he, made, he meant so much. Um, he was a wonderful journalist and a, and a great guy and a really loyal friend. We have some video of it, this meeting. You know, I don't want to thank we David Halberstam. We for met the 40 same. years ago, and we've been pals ever since. We I'm sure the goddaughter have. of one. And, you know, we worked together. I felt I was so lucky to have a, a, brother, a younger brother that I'd never had out there. And, I mean, to work with someone so fearless and so optimistic and so talented a reporter was one of the gifts of my life. Do you see any much over the 10 years between uh, the time we did this program? Yes, I, as I said, we'd talk on the phone and we'd see each other. He, he, he came down for my daughter's wedding. Uh, he, was my, he was the godfather of my, our older daughter. We, we kept up the relationship. But as you know, you're still controversial years later. I mean, you were responsible for the Pentagon Papers being published in the New York Times. But prior to that, you and David Halberstam and Malcolm Brown and all still have this this profile and people still can get upset to this day about what they think you did to the whole Vietnam War. What's your take on it all these years later? Were you right? I think we were right, yes. And what does that mean, being right? We told what was, we, we reported what was really happening in Vietnam. I mean, there was a, the, the command in, in those early years, General Harkins and the Ambassador General, uh, Ambassador Nolting, were convinced they were winning the war and that the Nagodin Ziem regime was, was respected by the population. It was, a, it was a myth. It was a total myth. They were losing the war and Ziem was despised by most of the population. Despite, it, was, it wasn't respected even by his own people when he'd come down for a speech at the National Assembly, which was a, which was a, a phony body he'd selected. 
you'd see the civil servants who were assembled to have a crowd. They'd lie down and go to sleep in the street. It was incredible. And, and we, would, we would go out to the countryside, and the advisors in the countryside, the military advisors like John Van, would tell us that the war was being lost. And then we would go out on military operations, and we would see it ourselves. And, and we'd go back to Saigon, and we'd write the story. Uh, and and, uh, and all hell would break loose from from the military headquarters. Who generally we'd be told how displeased General Parkins was uh, by by our our reporting. Well, the, the uh, I later on discovered that these advisors in the field who were telling us the truth were also telling the truth to General Harkins. I saw you know, when I wrote my book, I saw their reports. He just ignored them, ignored the reports of his own people who said, "General, we've got terrible problems here. We're losing the war." Schriever didn't do that sort of thing. Schriever, uh, one of the reasons Schriever succeeded at a very difficult task, uh, which was to overcome the technological uh, problems in inherent in building these missiles, was because he was willing to listen. He would always listen. He, and he'd tell his people, don't, he, he did not hold progress briefings like Harkins did. There was no retro, there was no retro briefing under uh, most army generals. And Parkins was a perfect example of it. There was always progress. There was, uh, Schriever held the uh, was was in the opposite. He told his people, "Look, I can give me the bad news. I can stand the bad news. I will not fire you for giving me the bad news. I will fire you if you don't give me the bad news." And they'd have a monthly briefing they called Black Saturday, <laughs> which was which was a, in which you talked about your problems. Because his attitude was, if we solve the problems, success will take care of itself. Come to this uh, statement you make in this book, and, and I'll ask you, why did you say that the George Bush Iraq War doomed to, and, then, and, and Don Rumsfeld, doomed to a resignation and disgrace because of his fervid promotion of the catastrophic war in Iraq? Why do you say that? Because it's gone on for all these years without any resolution whatsoever. Uh, we've spent... God knows how much money involved. I mean, we, we, in the process, we've lost a hell of a lot of lives. We've inflicted terrible pain on the, on the populations of, of Iraq and killed a hell of a lot of Iraqi people for no good end. There, there, there still is no, no resolution to it, and, 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 and no one has any idea of what's going to happen in the future except that there might well be more chaos. You don't, if George Bush had really been involved in the war in Vietnam, which he wasn't, he escaped it by joining the Texas National Guard, which his father got him into. Uh, and Cheney got five draft deferments. Rumsfeld was not involved in the war. Wolfowitz got several draft deferments. These men were not involved in Vietnam. If they had been, they might have known that you don't fight war unnecessary wars. You don't uh, go off and fight a war of choice, uh, which is what it was. Because once you fire the first shot, you don't know what's going to happen after that. Uh, and they, their misjudgments on Iraq were, are, were colossal. I mean, you saw it from the very beginning when the looting started in that museum in Baghdad. You realize this thing is out of control. These people have no idea what the hell they're doing. Back to the two books, the one on Vietnam and the current one on uh, Bernard Schriever and the whole ICBM effort. One or the other, easier or more difficult to write? They were both very difficult for me. Let me show you then what you said. This is uh, our, uh, on our, my sheet here, number six. And when we I ask you about something called writer's block back in our first interview uh, 21 years ago. Sure. Did you ever find yourself blocked when you were writing? Not blocked, but I found I would spend days battering away at a problem because you're looking at a book which is long, 360,000 words, but it covers an enormous span of years and events, and it's very telescoped, actually, in its, in its writing. And I would spend days, I, excuse me, I'd spend a day and not, and not finish what I had started out to do that day. I, I, I would not write those pages I had wanted to write that day because I hadn't solved the problem, let's say, of telescoping a historical section or telescoping a, a, a section on Van's life. And uh, I wouldn't be able to sleep that night. <laughs> uh, I might not solve the, the organizational problem of putting those pages together until the end of the day, let's say. Uh, and then I would, I'd go out and take a walk and come back and write down an outline, and then I'd be able to sleep. But some nights I couldn't sleep. 
Can you apply any of that feeling you had back then to this book? I was able to sleep this time, but <laughs> I got thoroughly exhausted through the process because I, it was the same problem. Uh, taking a vast amount of material and telescoping it into a narrative which, which, which told the truth, but which, uh, which, 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 which moved fast, which, which, which an ordinary reader would, not a specialist, because this book is not a hardware book, it's not written for specialists, it's written for the general public, which the ordinary reader would want to read. Uh, and I found that, uh, for instance, the amount of reading I had to do was enormous uh, on the Cold War, on figures like Stalin, who was, and, and then you, you pick out the nuggets of, of, of uh, it, it's like panning for gold. I mean, <laughs> you pan an awful lot of gravel just to get a fleck of gold. And, I, I would, and, and, I, and, and the same thing was true in, 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 I would write, I wrote, for instance, a profile of General May. Uh, who was the great opponent of, of, of this program. And the pro profile was much too long. I spent a long time researching it, a long time writing it, and then my editor and I agreed it was far too long. I had to tell the it was about 35 or 40 pages. Well, I had to tell the same thing in nine pages, but you don't just cut. Telescoping isn't cutting. You've got to say the same thing in nine pages that you said before in 36 pages. And all of this took enormous amounts of time. Bob Loomis, your editor for both the book 21 years ago and this book? Absolutely, yes. And I've been very lucky. He's a wonderful editor because he has a great, he, he helps you to shape a book. He has a great sense of pace and of narrative and when you've gone off the track uh, uh, and, 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 a, and a wonderful way of pulling you back on it. He doesn't, re, he doesn't edit, he's not a line editor. He'll suggest a word here or a word there. He, and he'll suggest changes in tone, but he makes you do it yourself. I'm going to go to page 287 of your book, and I don't know how much of this we can do, but I'm going to read back to you and stop periodically uh, to ask you questions about what I'm reading so people can get a sense of your narrative. This is chapter 46, Dazzling the Monarch is the title of it. Mm -hmm. Let me just briefly tell us why did you call this Dazzling the Monarch? Because Eisenhower, they had to go to the president to get this program going. Uh, they, they, they started it in 54, but the bureaucracy was so Im had built up so great in the period, in the post-war period, that it was impossible to really get the thing moving. Schriever had to go to 42 different people, uh, 42 different offices to get clearances for, for, for what he wanted. I mean, it was a, it was a hassle just to buy uh, an air conditioning uh, unit to protect uh, the, the, the computers for, for uh, this, this um, uh, s um, company that they, they, they hired for scientific expertise, Raymo Woldridge, which became later on TRW, Thompson Raymo Woldridge. They hired Simon Raymo as their scientific expert. A and so they had to get clearance of the type the Manhattan Project had had. Clearance from bureaucratic interference, streamlining, in other words, of decision making, plus funding, which was their own, which, which no one else could interfere with, which was, and only the president can give you that. Only the monarch can give you that. Let me read you this. Um, back to you. You've, you know these words, but I'll stop periodically and ask you questions. Benny Schriever arrived at the White House at 9.30 a.m. on July 28, 1955, half an hour before the scheduled briefing for the president. Trevor Gardner and Johnny Von Neumann were with him in the back seat of one of the Pentagon's long black Cadillac limousines as the car entered the rear gate to the White House grounds and made its way slowly up the circular drive. Schriever had been informed on July 11th that the briefing would take place on the 28th, and they have been readying themselves ever since, most intensely after Benny flew in from California on the 22nd. It had been decided that Schriever would anchor the briefing by wrapping up at the end. Trevor Gardner was, who was he? He was the uh, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for, for Science and Technology for, uh, and, and, and was, a, another t was, was in his own way a visionary. And Schriever had recruited him. Uh, Schriever, when he first got onto the, the idea, was just a colonel on the list for brigadier. That's pretty low in the pecking order at the Pentagon. He needed somebody higher to get the thing going. And Trevor Gardner was, had come on and he was a, he was another immigrant like Schriever. He'd gone to Caltech. 
He was a, an electric, electrical engineer by training, but a, uh, really a, 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 a technological visionary in his own right. Could see the problem. He could see the possibilities of technology in other fields, and Schriever recruited him. Bernie Schriever, you say in your book, until six was a German citizen. Well, yes, he came. He, that's all, all three of those men you mentioned were all immigrants. Schriever came here when he was six years old from Germany. His mother got here, brought her two sons here two months before we declared war on Germany in World War I. And they went down to Texas where he grew up. Uh, Trevor Gardner was a Welshman. His father was a boiler maker in mm -hmm. South America, <laughs> a boiler engineer. He came here when he was a young man, went through Caltech, got educated here. John von Neumann was a brilliant mathematician and mathematical physicist with a mind second only to Einstein's who developed uh, the first electronic computer uh, and developed stored programming for the computer, among other things. He came here as a refugee from Nazism. He was Hungarian born. Uh, and, and again, uh, and he was terribly important to the project because he had enormous prestige uh, from World War II. He, he had developed the, the plutonium, the, the explosive wrapper around the plutonium bomb, the Nagasaki bomb. He played a critical part in building the atomic bomb in the Manhattan Project, and he had great prestige. And Schriever again recruited him for the program. You pronounce it von Neumann? Von Neumann, yeah. Let me um, read ahead here. They had been told by the National Security uh, staff that they were restricted to a half an hour in all for the three presentations. Power, who was he? John, he was the uh, head of the Air Force Research and Development Command. He'd been LeMay's deputy at Strategic Air Command. Uh, he'd been LeMay's deputy really since World War II when he, he was the guy who flew over Tokyo during the famous firebombing. Uh, and then he'd been the deputy commander at SAC and then he was head of the, made head of the, the Air Force uh, Technical Command, the Air Force Research and Development Command. But he, he was, although he was LeMay's disciple, I'm a, rather LeMay's protege, he, had, he, he was not locked in. And Schriever had converted him to, uh, to, 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 to the idea of building these weapons. But you weapons. also mentioned in here um, Charlie Wilson. Yes, Engine Charlie Wilson. He was the Secretary of Defense, who was opposed to the program, but they overcame him too. I mean, they had enormous obstacles to overcome. They had to intrigue their way into this briefing. I mean, they, how do you, because they, they knew they had to get to see the president and get, get the president to, to, to give his imprimatur to this thing and clear the brush out of the way if they were going to get the job done. But you just don't ring up the president. Uh, so they went about an elaborate process of intrigue. They started, they leaked cl classified reports to a, a, a senator Henry Scoop Jackson, who was a big hawk from Washington. Uh, and he held hearings uh, in the Joint Atomic Energy Commission, uh, Committee, excuse me. And, and they fed him information for these hearings. And von Neumann appeared at the hearings, and, and, and Gardner appeared. There were closed hearings, secret hearings. And then Jackson and another prominent senator wrote President Eisenhower and said, you've got to look into this thing. This is terribly important and you're not looking at it and you've got to do something about it. You've got, to, you've got to be briefed on it. And Eisenhower told the head of the NSC to schedule a briefing, not knowing that the men who were going to brief him were the men who drafted the letter that Jackson had signed <laughs> and who'd instigated the whole thing. And the head of the, the National Security Council before the, before the uh, briefing when he's giving them instructions on how they've got to keep this thing to half an hour, et cetera, told them they were not under any circumstances to refer to this letter which had been sent to the president by Scoop Jackson, uh, not knowing that they were the guys who drafted the letter. <laughs> this kind of thing still goes on today. It still does, but it was, it was, the, it was very, sh I must say, very shrewdly done by them. And it was absolutely necessary because if they had, the briefing was on Jan July 28th. Eisenhower, the, then you had some bureaucratic ball or all to go through. Eisenhower signed off on the thing on September 13th, and then he had a heart attack 10 days later and wasn't able to hold a cabinet meeting for two months. But on the business of leaking, you got one of the biggest leaks of all time. Yes, that's true. Pentagon papers. <laughs> that's true, yes. And 
The Pentagon Papers, I remember when Robert McNamara was here years ago, I asked him whether or not he'd ever read the Pentagon Papers, and he, first of all, he told me they were in his garage, and he said he'd never read the papers. It may be true. I'm not sure he, I'm not sure that's true. Because? Because I think his conscience may have drawn him to, draw, to, to reading parts of the, in any case, and he knew we were going to publish it. And you've admitted who leaked you those papers? Well, they, they, Dan Ellsberg copied the papers. Let me go back to this narrative for this book. It's a com long, complicated story, yeah. but Dan Ellsberg copied the papers. You write, to, it's on page 289, Vince Ford and Burl Boatman had preceded them to the White House much earlier with the paraphernalia for the briefing. Their blue Air Force staff car had pulled up to the guard cubicle just inside the northwest gate to the White House off Pennsylvania Avenue at precisely 7.30 a.m., as I'm reading this, I'm saying to myself, how do you get this stuff? Who told you this stuff? Now, this is another important thing. Uh, Vince Ford had put together a memoir. He, Vince Ford was a colonel who worked for, for first for Schriever and then for, uh, for, for Gardner as his assistant. And Ford had written, using Schriever's papers, a memoir, which uh, he let me have. A copy. It was a huge manuscript. Never it published? Never published. It's sitting out in the Eisenhower Library now. It never will be published. It's well over a thousand pages. It's and he let you have it? And he let me have it. Did you read the whole thing? I read the whole thing. And also, uh, I read all of Schriever's papers, which were vast as well. And a matter of fact, on the page before here, there's a quote. Oh, no, it's on the same page. And I wanted to ask you about this because you say he wrote this in his diary that night, the night, I guess, before, termites in the woodwork. Yes, that was Schriever's term. For, for, because he sensed the hostility of, when they got this briefing from the head of the NSC, who told him, now, gentlemen, you're restricted to half an hour, and you're not to refer to this letter from Senator Jackson to the president in order to pressure him into to, to doing anything that you want him done, to do. Uh, Schriever realized this man was not in favor of the program, and his term for that was termites in the woodwork. He had wonderful phrases. How, sure. how much of a diary did he keep? In? He kept, uh, uh, his diary was very sporadic. Uh, he kept, it, it was a daily th diary, but it was a working diary. He'd write down appointments uh, uh, which, and, and, and remarks. Uh, they tended to be very terse, except when something big occurred. And then he'd write a memorandum, as he did for this briefing, uh, which uh, he gave me. He, his memorandum is the, and what, what Vince Ford added to it in his memoir is the only record of the briefing that exists. Is Vince Ford alive? No, he's dead too. He was Benny Schriever's age and they're both, they're both he preceded Schriever. He's and, buried over And his on. job was? He was assistant to Gardner, but his job was really intriguing. His job was behind the behind the behind the scenes man for Schriever and and, and and Gardner. How much were you able to talk to him? I interviewed him at great length as well. Is all this on tape? Yes, it's all on tape. It's 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 uh, sitting at, at home in my computer. The transcripts of the interviews. Uh, I don't. I'm, I do, I'm not online. I don't have email because I've been warned by the computer gurus that the the uh, uh, if I did get it sooner or later somebody would would. I'd get a bug in that computer and lose the book. As long so, as we're talking about this, because uh, I assume uh, you'll have the similar reaction to all this. I've got in my hands the Neil Sheehan papers, a finding aid to the collection in the Library of Congress, and we had some video on your collection there. You can see it on the screen. Oh. Uh, where is this over there from the John Paul Van story? Uh, well, I will <clears throat> eventually give these papers to the library as well. Uh, there's the papers I, I gathered in the course of writing this book. The van, the, my personal papers went over to the library to be put with the van's papers because, because when I wrote the, the Vietnam book, I had all of John's paper, John Van's papers. His family gave them to me, and uh, in exchange for a uh, share of the film rights. Can the public see this? Oh yes, yeah. All you have to do is go to the Library of Congress, go in the manuscript division, reading room, and it's fully available. Are your audio tapes in this collection? Yes, from your interviews. Are. Yeah, yep. Yeah. 285 of them from the Vietnam book. How many of them? 285 from the Vietnam book. And how many are you going to have from this book? Uh, well, uh, I did 120 interviews. Uh, I'd say about maybe 150. Can people record them? 
Well, they can, I don't know if they can record them. You have to ask the library that. But they're there available. To they will be available to listen to just as my Vietnam tapes are available to listen to. I believe in preserving these things. And the Library of Congress does a wonderful job of preserving under Jim Billington uh, has set up a system where there's great, there's perfectly, there's wonderful security in the manuscript reading room. You have to agree to be searched. You lock up your everything, including your pens. They issue you a pencil and they bring out the papers for you to look at. Back to uh, the narrative on this meeting in the White House uh, in 1955. It, you say here that uh, it was often, uh, the room, room is a broadcast room. Is that still there? I don't know. I, you know. It's been very hard. I don't think it is. In the West Wing of the White House? Yeah, in the West Wing of the White House. It, it, the White House keeps changing constantly. And as far as I can figure out, that's, that room is gone. Did you try to go in there and see it? I, d I did, but I, I, I was told, well, nobody really understood whether it w knew whether it still existed or not. It probably is another room. It's another, uh, if it's still there, it's another room. You say here, it was often used for briefings, and on this humid Washington morning in July, it was filled with rows of straight back wooden chairs. The one exception to this austere seating was a capacious, plumply stuffed red leather armchair in the center of the first row for the comfort of the president. Why did you put that in there? Uh, because it's a nice detail. And because he was the monarch. Uh, now, you have to remember that after World War II, when we had a president in Roosevelt, who was such a great and towering figure. The, pres the American presidency acquired enormous prestige. And, and uh, it, it, until the war in Vietnam changed matters and tipped things the other way, the, president was in the, f was, 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 the presidency was far outweighed in, 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 in influence, the legislative or the judicial branches of the government. And the president was treated as a, as, as a monarch, I mean, to the point of John Kennedy adding six or eight trumpets to the three or four they had there already. It had a regal atmosphere to it. And Eisenhower, of course, had also the reputation of having been commander in chief during World War II. So he really was the monarch. You point out that the meeting got started a little late. Normally, presidents arrive, some presidents arrive on time uh, at 10 o'clock. He didn't, uh, then I read, uh, they had not waited long when suddenly the door swung open and Eisenhower appeared striding at a fast pace down the corridor. He seemed angry about something, his face flushed. Whatever it was apparently concerned Defense Secretary Wilson, who was walking beside him. By the way, Secretary Wilson used to run General Motors? Yes, he was called Engine Charlie Wilson for that reason. He was hurrying to keep up as the two men swept past Ford and Boatman and into the briefing room. The briefing then, what happened? Well, uh, the President sat down, he nodded. Uh, to the head of the NSC, who was already up on the podium, uh, and, the, and he gave a very brief introduction, and the first guy to get up was Gardner. And the tactic was very clever. Gardner scared the bejesus out of, the, out of everybody in the room. And you're talking about the whole of the American establishment, the governmental establishment here, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, other members of the Joint Chiefs, uh, the cabinet secretaries, uh, he, he, he proceeded to tell them just how dangerous a situation this was. The Soviets were on the, in the process of building these things. We were not doing it uh, seriously because of the impediments to it. And it was 15 minutes to doomsday <laughs> because that's how much, that's the only warning you got. And then he passed it to von Neumann who uh, again scared the living bejesus out of these people. Uh, he gave them a, a, an analysis of the nuclear capability, you know, the, the, the size of the warhead, uh, the, the explosive force, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and then they, they set it up so that Schriever could wrap it up and tell what was needed to get this thing done to correct this very dangerous situation. You have one line here I want to read. He had no intimation, intimation that on this, we're talking about von Neumann, one of the most eventful days of his life, he had less than 19 months to live to which that cancer was cursing through his body. It was a tragic thing. John von Neumann, <clears throat> he's not well remembered now. It's very sad because he died at the age of 53. He had testicular cancer and they just discovered, just, they, they hadn't yet discovered it just before the briefing. They discovered it a month later in August, and he died then uh, 19 months later in, 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 in Walter Reed.
there's a, a lot more that we're not going to be getting to because sure. of, it's a long narrative. But uh, what did the president r say after this briefing, and how long did the briefing go? The briefing, the briefing lasted and ran an hour and a half uh, because von Neumann, in particular, ran way over his time, uh, but did, never lost a bit of the attention. They could see from the beginning they had the attention of the president and of the audience. And then Schriever got up to give the final briefing, and they had eight, an eight-minute film of rocket engine testing out at Santa Susana in California, uh, where they were testing the first engines, uh, these fiery things. They, they'd lash them down on, on concrete uh, uh, stands and, 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 and test them, fire them. And they had a, 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 an eight-minute film of this to show the president at the end of the briefing if he wanted to see it. And so Schriever knew how much they were overrunning, they were running over their time. So he, he started his briefing, and he was a very impressive figure, this handsome. Benny Schriever was one of the most handsome men I've ever met. And he was really, in, in those days, with the, with the uniform and the, 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 those st striking good looks, this tall man, six foot three, slim. Um, he, he started his briefing, and then he stopped. And he said, Mr. President, we also have an eight-minute film we'd like to show at the end of this if you uh, uh, w wish to see it. And Eisenhower nodded to him. In other words, you've got all the time you want, General. Just go right ahead and brief me. Tell me what's going on here. And Ford noticed that Eisenhower had moved forward and he was sitting on the edge of his chair. <laughs> he was no longer sitting back in the, back in the uh, uh, easy chair. He was on the edge of it, as uh, sitting like this as Schriever uh, was briefing him on what they needed to get to do to get this thing uh, working. And you say that General Eisenhower got up to the podium after that and said, this has been most impressive, most impressive. There is no question this weapon will have a profound impact on all aspects of human life, not only in the United States, but in every corner of the globe, military, sociological, political. Was that a, uh, accurate, did it pan out to be an accurate statement? Well, it's, it's, it's a bit broad. But it, it's true in the sense that what, what, it, what it did was to keep the peace. I've got to ask you, though, on the next page, you bring in the Vice President of the United States then, Richard Nixon. And what you quote here is he's him saying, why haven't we started this sooner after, this, after General Eisenhower right. left the room? What's been the holdup, the Vice President said, tapping the palm of his left hand with the stiffened fingers of his right in a gesture of emphasis that was peculiar to Nixon. Yes, Nixon would do that. And the reason I bring it up, though, is that five years later, in 1960, Missile Gap was a charge from the Kennedy administration, yes. or the Kennedy candidate, to the Eisenhower administration. And it turned out that after it was over, suppose there was no Missile Gap. So fill us in on that one. Well, uh, there, there was a Missile Gap. The gap was on the Soviet side. By that time, Schriever and his, and his guys had, had surpassed the Soviets in the race to, to, be, to build, to be, to build a, an ICBM and to, and to create a, a nuclear stalemate. And so, but, but, but politics being what it was, and re, you remember, we, just, we still had just the U-2 then. We didn't have the spy satellites. Uh, and uh, the U-2 showed that there the Soviets did not have, uh, there was no missile gap. They did not have a usable force of ICBMs. And Eisenhower, but Eisenhower didn't want to admit what he was getting from the U-2. He, uh, he, 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 he held things close to his chest. And he, Nixon had been briefed on it, and they briefed Kennedy on it. And Kennedy stopped talking who was using this missile gap business. They were all, the, this country has been filled f from the beginning of the Cold War with fear mongers, <laughs> beginning with that really erroneous long telegram of Kennan's, and then Nitz's and, and Atchison's hysterical national security action, national security memorandum 68, and it's just, which you know, the Russians are coming. Stalin has the plan for world conquest. They're stronger than we are. They'll, they'll be in Paris in the morning kind of business. And, and so Kennedy was taking advantage of this to charge that there was a missile gap. The Russians were ahead of us. And he was briefed on it, given the secret briefing as presidential candidates did. And he stopped talking about it himself. But he didn't, 
<laughs> he didn't tell his other campaign supporters to stop talking about it. Well, let me ask you then, uh, again, we come forward to the time now. Back then, and in your book, you talk a lot about Thompson, Ramo, and Woolridge, Woolridge, who people today would know as the TRW Corporation. Yes. They were involved in all this talk. Did they end up benefiting from building of the missile? Oh, yes, yeah. Simon Ramo, <coughs> who was the scientific, Shriver realized, and so did Gardner, that we did not have an aerospace industry in this country. We had an aircraft industry in 53, 54, but not, not an aerospace industry. The aircraft companies were not capable of providing the expertise needed to overcome the technological problems involved in building this missile. So they had to create an aerospace industry. They had to get the expertise to do it. And, and Ramo, who was a product of, <coughs> of, Cal, was of Caltech again, and who'd been up at General Electric and then started his own company uh, with, with Dean Woolridge after turning, uh, after building the first air-to-air -air missile uh, the, uh, for the Air Force at the Hughes Aircraft, was, was, a, was uh, they spotted him. Uh, they realized that he not only had the sense, the expertise to, to, to overcome these these technological obstacles himself, but he would gather the talent that was necessary to do it. And he and Woolridge broke away from Hughes and formed a company which was designed to get high-class uh, talent, uh, to get recruited, uh, high-technology talent. And so Schriever and Gardner recruited him and put him to work, Ramo to work, uh, both technically both Ramo and his partner Woolridge. But it turned it out with Raymond. And, and the reputation they built uh, was the basis for TRW. As I said, 21 years ago, you sent us on this mission of a, over a thousand interviews in this time slot, but mostly about books. But I want to show the audience what you said 21 years ago uh, about the impact of the book you wrote, Bright Shining Lie, on your family and give us an update on the family. Let's watch this. The book was a, was a, was a very difficult time for the family all those years. Uh, although, actually, we, it made us closer as a family. I was around to help raise my children, whereas I might have been on the road. Two kids? Two kids, two daughters. I think, I think the girls uh, are happy with, with what's happened. The book, Daddy's book is finally done. <laughs> how, how old are the daughters? Um, our youngest is 19, and uh, throughout most of her life, uh, it was Daddy's book. And the uh, uh, a family word was when Daddy's book is done. Well, Daddy's book is finally done, <laughs> and I think they're happy. Those daughters are how old now? Well, one is 42, and the other one is 39. Where are they? Uh, the younger one is um, uh, the special assistant to the general counsel of the FBI. She's here in Washington. She's married. She's given us one grandson, and she's pregnant with another boy. And the older daughter has been unfortunately disabled through failed cervical surgery on the neck. She's active in a sense that she's she's able to drive and move around, but she can't she, she can't work a, a, anymore. But uh, we she still has uh, we have a very we have a very close relationship with both of them. And wife Susan, wife Susan is still writing. She writes now mainly for Architectural Digest, uh, but she, uh, because the New Yorker has changed. And they both were very patient. They've all been very patient with the book, uh, as they were with the first one. Daddy's so, book is slow. We're out of time, and this looks like a lot like the last book that you wrote. They cover here, Neil Sheehan, A Fiery Peace in a Cold War, Bernard Schriever, and The Ultimate Weapon. That's the ICBM. We thank you, uh, Neil Sheehan, for joining us. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.